Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study. As always, you may share, support, and subscribe. You may subscribe wherever you are hearing this program. You may share the very words of God that you hear read aloud and recited. And you may share the link to wherever you found it. You may support at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. We are continuing our spiritual swords assault upon the imperial city of Rome with the scroll of Romans chapter 3. We will begin today with verses 1 to 8, and we are in the KJV. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Well, what is the advantage of Judaism, of being a biological descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, these people were entrusted with the oracles of God. This is not the Oracle database company. This is not the Oracle at Delphi, although that is a little bit closer. These oracles are prophecies, are teachings of God. This refers to the Tanakh, the combination of the Torah, the Nebim, and the Ketubim the instruction or the teaching and the prophets and the extra writings or simply the writings. So having that means they get to taste the salvation, the rescue, and the deliverance of God through his teaching. They're first in line. They get access to it before anyone else. But this is a tricky advantage because it's also a disadvantage. How is it a disadvantage? Because if you hear the judgment first, that means you should know how to respond to the judgment better than anyone else because you've had more time. The next kind of point here, which is big, is that even if all human beings were liars, God would be found truthful. God would be found faithful. God would be found to be loyal. And so we do not have godly truthfulness, godly faithfulness, and godly loyalty, but we can strive towards this perfection as much as we can with the knowledge that all of us will fall short of the glory of God, as it says towards the end of this chapter, and we'll get to that. It's one of my favorite verses. But these people are are slandering Paul and his group, and remember that the word diabolos, which is the word from which we get devil, means slanderer. So this is a diabolical deed to slander, to ruin one's reputation, to bring someone's name down. Remember, there's power in Hashem, in the name, and thus in a name, because it is the presence of a person. <clears throat> God is judge, and this is the reminder that we should align ourselves with the precepts, the statutes, the oracles, the teaching that he has given us, whether we're first in line or second in line or last. And we'll see this idea play out in the rest of the chapter. Let's go to verses 9 to 20. What then? Are we better than they? 
No, in no wise, for we have proved, we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that with what things soever the teaching saith, it saith to them who are under the teaching, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the teaching is the knowledge of sin. This is a mismatch, a uh, mismatch, a uh, hodgepodge, a potpourri of various verses from the Psalms, from Ecclesiastes, and from Isaiah. No one is good. And this is said <laughs> with repetition. This is said with great emphasis, with great synonyms. And this is a reminder in many different ways that we are all incomplete. And to be incomplete in the biblical or scriptural world is to lack perfection. So the job is to stand before the seated judge and to shut our mouths so that his teaching could be the only thing that speaks. So his teaching is the only thing that teaches. And so that all of us acknowledge whether we're senior or junior toward each other, we're all junior to him. And we are all students of the one teacher. So this reminds us constantly that no matter how much we do, we are not good. I remember teaching this in a Bible study at a time. And I had a student tell me that they had encountered people who said they hadn't sinned in 10 years or they hadn't sinned in 15 years. And I could do nothing but let out a chuckle and a chortle because anyone who has claimed they haven't sinned in 10 to 15 years is not doing a good job of self-awareness, is not doing a good job of self-examination. And remember that the criteria of self-examination and self-awareness is not yourself but is scripture. And in the Orthodox Church, we have the tradition of having the witness before God, which is the priest, which is the teacher and professor of confession, which is to aid and abet you in using scripture to examine yourself. So if nothing else, use this passage here, use the Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Isaiah to remind yourself to shut your mouth before the teaching of Yahweh, before the teaching of the Lord. Verses 21 to the end. But now the righteousness of God without the teaching is manifested, being witnessed by the teaching and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus." Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what teaching? Of works? Nay, but the teaching of faith. 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the teaching. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the teaching through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the teaching. This is very important. <laughs> the teaching is established. The teaching is upheld. We'll come back to that. All fall short of the glory of God. All are incomplete. All lack perfection. No one is good. No, not one. So by Placing your faith, which is your utmost and superlative trust in Jesus, the playing field is leveled. All are made equal and egalitarian in submission to the monarch, King Jesus. Your boasting has been excluded so that boasting in him can be included. We are justified, that is to say, declared righteous outside of the religious observance for example the sabbaths the new moons the incense the circumcision the dietary laws that we find in the torah or in the teaching but that is replaced or substituted with the teaching of faith which is the teaching of trust which is an, a hyper version of the moral teaching of the torah we get into this discussion on one of the older episodes of this podcast from September 7th, 2020, in the year of our Lord, about an 81-minute discussion with Professor Matthew J. Thomas on religion and politics. But we, we focus in on this idea, Father Dustin Lyon, on his program, The Way, which is also part of the Ephesus School Network that I'm a part of, goes into this in depth there. So I, uh, I encourage you to go search for Professor Matthew Thomas with Father Dustin Lyon on The Way. And you can also check out my episode, which is called Justification, Maccabees, and Comparative Politics. The name of Professor Matthew Thomas's book is Paul's Work of the Law in the Perspective of Second Century Reception. In short, to rehash what we spoke about that day, you have what is called the new perspective, which is that of the likes of N.T. Wright, you have the old perspective, which is typically of the Protestant reformers like Luther and Calvin and Zinguili and probably others. And then you have what are the oldest perspectives. And weirdly enough, the new perspective matches the oldest perspectives. And the old perspective is not that old at all. And the oldest perspectives he finds through his research witnesses of the first, second, and third centuries of Christ um, of Christ's and his teaching and his apostles. So the greater the distance, the less kind of reliable in research setting, people would say that these perspectives are, but he shows that the different levels of trustworthy testimonies match the kind of scholarship of N.T. Wright over and against people like James White of the Calvinist or Reformed tradition and people like the Reformers. And so the issue is that the the reformers position was that nothing good, nothing charitable should be done because that's what works refers to the perspective of the new perspective. And in fact, NT right has his own translation, the, um, the kingdom new Testament. And there he, I believe uses religious observance as a term. I think that's where I picked it up from reading that translation of the new Testament rather than works of the law because of this confusion and the understanding of N.T. Wright and of the oldest witnesses of Christendom regarding this passage and other passages of justification and being declared righteous is that there is a difference between external religious observance and the doing of mercy, which takes care of the weaker neighbor, which is an act of mercy, an act of charity. And the universal God, who is the God of not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well, the universal God of Jews and Gentiles, 
requires, not just invites you to, but requires slavery or servitude to him, bond of servitude to him, including acts of mercy. But what he is not so keen on are on these religious observances. So the replacement here is these external signs with trust, but external signs does not mean stop taking care of the neighbors and strangers and enemies. And thus, as we said earlier, the teaching is established and upheld, but never nullified. Glory to God for all things.